publicly available on the website for both of the natural resource management plans. Uh, so uh, again, welcome to a discussion of the natural resource management plans for both Whitetail Woods Regional Park and uh, River River Greenway Regional Park. And uh, these natural resource management plans will be discussing work that is proposed or end will end has already been done. Um, and uh, we're going to start with the Whitetail Woods Regional Park plan at six until six thirty, and then starting at six thirty, we plan to discuss the River to River Greenway. Plan. So with that, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm uh, one of the natural resource specialists with Dakota County. My name is Chris Klatt, and uh, I will just let some of the other co-hosts um, introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Joe Walton. I am also, I work for Parks, um, County Parks. I am the senior ecologist for the county. Lil, do you want to take, introduce yourself? Yeah, and I'm Lil Latham. I'm with the Office of Planning, and I'm really here to help take notes. And um, so you won't hear from me much during the meeting. Okay, well, thanks. And then we'll start then. Joe, do you want to take it away with the White Tail Woods and our empty? Sure. Okay, so um, we are here, we are with in the midst of. Actually, we're towards the end of the planning process for Whitetail Woods uh, Park. Um, we've been developing this plan for the past couple of years, and it's progressed through the research and findings phase to the development of the visions, goals, and recommendations phase. And we created a work plan for management of the park for the next 20 years. And we would love to hear your input on the plan. So the following slides summarize the plan and its contents. Uh, Whitetail Woods is a 456 acre regional park located in Empire Township in the central part of the county. Part of the Vermilion Highlands, it's an open space collaboration between the DNR, the University of Minnesota, and Dakota County and Empire Township. It includes the park, the Vermilion Highlands research and recreation area, the wildlife management area, and the aquatic management area. And altogether, this totals nearly 5,000 acres of contiguous open space. There are approximately 20 acres of impervious surfaces in the park, uh, primarily the road, picnic shelter, and newly constructed paved trail that loops around Empire Lake. The park accommodated approximately 100,000 visits last year, and that number grows every year. One of the greatest challenges of managing our natural parks is to balance the needs and impacts of, that people present with the needs and requirements of wildlife in, in the natural communities. This plan attempts to accomplish that. So with that, we would like to uh, put a, a question to you folks. Um, and please uh, answer this poll. There's three questions on this first one, and I'll just read them, read them off. How familiar are you with Whitetail Woods Park? Second one is, have you noticed any changes in the park's natural resources in the past few years? And the last one is, if I can read it, do you feel the changes are better for the better or for the worse? We'll give you a, a couple seconds here to answer. Okay, the results are in. Um, looks like there's only two, pe three people that responded, but of those three people, two are very familiar. One is somewhat with the park. Um, one has noticed many changes over the last couple of years and two have noticed a few. And the last one, everybody agrees that it's for the better. So that's great. Um, th thank you very much for that, and I'm glad to hear that you that you think the changes are for the better. Um, so with that, let's move forward. Well, one, one thing I did want to say is, from my experience, I noticed that most people 
are pretty familiar with the picnic shelter area right by the parking lot, but not everybody goes beyond that area. Um, and the park really is pretty amazing and it's worth exploring. So the next couple slides, um, we're gonna sort of take you through a tour of the park. Okay, the pre-settlement vegetation, meaning the vegetation that was there at the time right before um, Euro-American Euro settlement in about the 1850s, um, is what is shown on this slide. You can see that most of it was prairie. Um, now, pre-settlement vegetation for, for, uh, for ecologists that do restoration is sort of the gold standard for what we want to restore things to. Um, we use it as our goal, but we realize that we'll probably never fully restore an area to what it was historically. Um, some cases warrant a different path. For example, if they're really too far gone or if they're just, they went from like an open grassland situation to a fully uh, forested area, maybe it's just too difficult to get them back to what they were. Um, so we do make some judgment calls on that, but pre-settlement vegetation is, is the goal that we're after. Uh, the next couple of slides show aerial photographs from um, this slide, I'm sorry, shows aerial photographs from the site. The first one is from 1964. Um, you can see that, I'll, I'll just, and, then, and the last one, the other one on the right is from 2017. I just want to point out a couple things that jump out to me uh, when I look at these. Um, the upland areas surrounding the park even in 1967, and I didn't show you the 1937s, which are our oldest ones, but they're pretty much all surrounded by farm fields. Um, you can see the rectangular figures and the, and the, like the, these lines in there. That represents um, vegetate, you know, crop fields and, and plowing marks and things like that. In the middle here, this is where the park is. And, before 19, the, the 1960s, you don't see the lake. Over here in 2017, obviously there's a big lake. That's because this earthen berm was constructed in the 1960s by the former landowner. Um, and we think it's that he wanted to have a way to get his cattle from one side of this wetland complex to the other. These areas over here are wooded, they're oak woodlands. So that, that's kind of the big thing, um, two big things. The wetlands were impacted. Um, upstream of the berm, obviously it got a lot wetter. It impounded the water and created this lake. Downstream of the berm, it made it a little drier. Um, you, I don't know if you can see for sure, but there, right here there's a ditch. Um, the wetlands were straightened and they were ditched as part of the, the farming operations out there. Um, so, so there's quite, quite a bit of changes. Um, pine plantations, you can see in the 2017 aerials, there's a big one here, there's another big one here. They're kind of scattered all over the park. They were non-existent in 1964. <clears throat> so the pines were planted mostly in the 1970s. And from what, what I've um, experienced, it's sort of a common misconception that the, these pine stands were some like part of an ancient primeval pine forest that was here. That's not the case. Actually, it was the prairie that was the historical condition and that dates back for thousands of years. But unfortunately, we only have tiny little bits of the prairie left. Um, eco ecological restoration began in 2013. It was considerably ramped up in 2015, and it continues today. The park was purchased in 2008 by the county, and capital improvements began in 2012. Mainly, the road was constructed. Whoop. Okay. Um, this slide shows the ecological condition of the area. 
that big red blob you see in the middle here, that was, um, this was indicating high biological diversity significance um, by, the, by the Department of Natural Resources, who did a survey in the 1990s in this area. And they found that um, there were a lot of different sorts of plants and animals, a, a, a variety of different types of um, communities. So they ranked it high, which is really great. Um, and if we properly manage this, this park, we think that we can make a wonderful uh, habitat for, for plants and animals and for people to enjoy. The next couple of slides, uh, we're going to talk about the ecological communities of the park. So the first one that we're going to talk about is, that I'm going to talk about, is uh, Empire Lake. This lake was, as we saw in the former um, slide, really re a recent uh, phenomenon. It was impounded by the construction of, of the dam in the 1960s, um, and it altered the wetland that was there before. Um, in 2018 and 2019, staff, uh, natural resources staff from the county surveyed the entire park. We looked at the lake and we, we measured how deep it was. We measured the, the water quality, the clarity, um, the temperature, dissolved oxygen. And we found that uh, true to form, this is a very shallow lake. It's only about one and a half to five feet deep, two feet at the most. Um, so that you'd expect that from an area that was, you know, impounded by this berm and it used to be a, a, a wetland. So given that, you wouldn't expect it to be like this beautiful, pristine lake that you might find in northern Minnesota. No, it's going to be chock full of vegetation. And as you see from the, the pictures on this slide, um, that is the case. Uh, we really couldn't see very far down when we uh, examined to see how, how the water clarity, we only got about one and a half feet at the very most because then we ran into vegetation. Um, we did find some interesting vegetation in this, in this lake. It was dominated by this submerged plant, you can kind of see it in this photo. It's called um, coontail. And coontail is a plant that grows in usually in disturbed shallow lakes. It doesn't have much of a root system, so it doesn't really provide good stability to the soils and the lake beds um, as some of, the, of our other submerged plants do, like, pond, like our pond weeds. Um, but it does provide uh, some benefits um, to, to the lake and for, for the fish and, and so forth. There are fish in the lake. We never did a, a formal survey, but we have seen uh, very small like sunfish throughout the lake. Um, nothing very big though. We did find an interesting uh, thing here. We found a, a, a bed of water lotus, which um, is sort of, it, 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 it surprised me. It's an uncommon plant, and, and you usually find it associated with high quality uh, rivers. We, we see it in the Minnesota River and some backwater, backwater lakes. This really isn't connected to a, a river. Um, so it was a little surprising, but it's, it was really, really fun to see that. As you go further up, up watershed, to the west in the lake, um, you run into more and more of a, of a wetland condition. It becomes less and less deep water. So with that, I'd like to pose another question to you all. Um, we, since the submerged vegetation of the lake is not that diverse, we're considering introducing, potentially introducing some more beneficial species to increase the diversity in the habitat. One plant we're considering is wild rice. How do you feel about introducing wild rice to Empire Lake? Hey, 
Hey, Joe, while we're I'm waiting for the poll to wrap up, there's a question of what year did the park open to the public? Um, I, that's a good question. I know that the master plan occurred in 2012. I think it was somewhere around 2012. Maybe commission, maybe the commissioners can enlighten me on that though. We did the ribbon cutting in 2014, the grand opening. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, so that poll um, results are in, and it looks like most people feel that it, it's a good idea, but they want to examine the effects first. Um, several people didn't have an opinion and one thought it was a great idea. I guess I would be in the camp of, of the let's, it's probably a good idea, but let's examine it first. I agree with the majority. Um, it's possible that wild rice could like um, become a dominant plant and sort of choke out other things and it, it might change the whole quality of the lake. So it's something that we have to consider very carefully before we, we go ahead and do something like that. Thank you for your answers. Okay, um, going to the wetlands. The wetlands of this park are pretty amazing. Um, they, there are many different wetlands and they vary in quality from ditches to high quality seepage meadows. The highest quality wetlands are at the far west end of Empire Lake near the boardwalk where we found a highly diverse wet meadow plant community that supports many plants including some uncommon ones and those are the ones that uh, are pictured on this slide. Um, interestingly, it's one of the few spots in the parks that we have found the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, which is right there. Um, and this butterfly is sort of uncommon in the vicinity. It's not a rare um, species, but I don't see it that often. Like many other Lepidopterans, this butterfly has very specific symbiotic relationship with its uh, specific host plant. In this case, the turtle head plant, which is way over in the top left corner here. Um, and without that plant, it would not be able to survive because its larvae, it, the, the, the adults lay the eggs on that plant and the larvae eat the leaves. It's just one example of why this park is so special. Whoop. Um, oak woodlands. Oak woodlands dominate the uplands south of uh, Empire Lake. The woodlands are of moderate to high quality with many large and mature oaks and other trees such as big tooth aspen and black cherry and hackberry. You can't tell from these pictures, but recently um, buckthorn was a dominant plant under the oaks, but co our, we contracted crews which have removed most of it. And today we're happy to say that it is mostly under control. We still need to follow up with the management um, on buckthorn, as you probably all know, um, or else it will re-sprout and the seedlings will come back. Um, but if we keep on top of it with prescribed burning, um, and mowing and, and things like that, we should be able to keep it under control. Um, the reason buckthorn became overabundant in our woodlands is mainly due to fire suppression over the last 150 years. Also the reduction of grazing, which is a, was another um, ecological process that was natural to these um, systems. Since we've reintroduced fire recently to the, to the park, we have seen spring ephemerals such as bloodroot and wild oats and blue cohosh just come back with a great abundance. And we, this plan recommends to continue to burn on um, uh, regular intervals that are healthy for, for the community. 
Um, prairie remnants. Since most of the area consisted of prairie prior to European settlement, it makes sense that we would uh, see some evidence of, those re of the, that prairie that persists today. And in fact, we do. There are several prairie remnants scattered throughout the site. Some of these are high quality remnants with a diversity of species, um, but some of them are quite degraded. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a nice picture of a beautiful blooming prairie. Uh, I meant to put one in here. We do have a couple examples of some beautiful prairies out there. The ones that are shown here, here this one is uh, a little bit degraded, but, it, but it's, it's very interesting. Um, it's just west of the parking lot. It's up on an old glacial deposit uh, of sand. And it's what we call a sand gravel prairie, which is kind of a rare um, natural community in the area. And here you can find uh, native species like side oats, grandma, purple prairie clover, lead plant, and um, spreading dog bane, amongst other, other plants. Um, so it, it's a really unusual little community. Um, farther north of, the, of this area, we have other prairie remnants on different glacial deposits, which are a little bit <coughs> um, moister in their um, moisture regime. And they have other, other plants like fringe pacoon and prairie violet and Indian turnip. So our prairie remnants on this, in this area are, are doing pretty well. There are some challenges. There were some, uh, a lot of uh, amber maple next to some of these um, remnants. We've removed the amber maple, but th we're continuing to deal with um, the seedlings with, that have um, seeded themselves in, the, in invading these areas. Um, we've also restored prairies and savannas throughout the park. Um, and this is a picture of a prairie on the east side of the park about one year after it was seeded. Wildlife throughout the park is, a, is, is quite varied. Um, we have different species from ground squirrels to fox to badger to hawks to eagles, marsh birds, turtles, and songbirds of all types. Um, we have insects and pollinators throughout the park. Uh, we also do a, a pretty good job of monitoring the animals um, on a yearly basis usually. And in this photo you can see that we have a snapping turtle on the right and a blandings turtle on the left. The blandings turtle is a threatened species in Minnesota and it as, is doing pretty, pretty well in this park. Um, the Natural Resource Management Plan um, calls for continued monitoring and surveys of the wildlife in the park. The plan has developed a vision for the park and it is, here it is, I'd just like to read it. The water, vegetation, and wildlife of Dakota County Parks, including Whitetail Woods, will be managed to conserve biodiversity restore native habitats, improve public benefits, and achieve resilience and regionally outstanding quality now and for future generations. White, and the one on the lower right comes from the master plan, which says that Whitetail Woods Regional Park is a healthy mosaic of natural and community spaces that restore the human spirit where people can gather, celebrate, and be inspired. Outstanding recreation and learning experiences heighten awareness and appreciation of a relationship with nature. I think those are two very inspiring visions and uh, what a great thing to aspire to. As part of the Natural Resource Management Plan, we have developed um, <clears throat> goals, not only a vision, but goals. And here are listed the goals. The first um, goal deals with restoring ecosystem processes that have been lost or curtailed. Examples of this are um, fire, grazing, and hydrology, which we're trying to restore a little bit to what their historic conditions would have been. 
The other goals are conserving and increasing biodiversity and achieving ecological resilience while at the same time enhancing the experience for the park visitor. Um, in addition to these more large sweeping, sweeping type goals, we've made recommendations that are more site specific for the park. And here's a few of them here um, listed here. We hope to try to restore all the parts of the park that aren't being devoted to um, recreational elements. And those areas that haven't been restored already, we want to enhance those. Most of the park has already been restored. Um, so what we're gonna be dealing with is enhancements. Um, we want to soften the edge between the community boundaries so that it feels like one continuous habitat. Hey, hi Joe, this is Lil. We have another question, yes. which is um, what creek flows into Empire Lake? And also, I just want to mention that it's um, almost 6.30. Yes. Okay, thank you, Lil. <laughs> what creek flows into White, into Empire Lake? Um, I looked into that. That's a good question. I don't think there is a, there is really not a creek. It's, it's really not a named creek. Um, it's a seepage that comes from the surrounding hills. The, the water seeps out of the ground slowly at the base of the wetland continuously and it forms, that's what gives the water that make up the wetlands and the lake. So it's really not a creek, it's a seepage area, groundwater seepage. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so thank you for taking this, um, this other poll that we have up here. Um, <clears throat> so the results are being shared and how did you feel about the direction, vision and goals of the plan? Seems like most people think it's just right. And one says it's very good, but still needs a little work. Well, well, that, that's encouraging. Thank you. Um, any feedback you can give us about what needs to be further done, I would be happy to receive either in an email or you can talk to me later um, or you can ask me questions after the presentation. So I appreciate that. In, we better keep moving on though, or we're gonna get bogged down here. Uh, losing cut. Can you still hear me? Oh, there we go. Where's my where did my cursor go? Okay. All right, we've developed priorities um, for the park in, in and its management. And here we show some of the higher priorities that we have determined um, for the park. Um, generally, the, the highest priorities are the rare features, those that are important to other, other species or keystone species, we call those. Important water resources, higher quality areas like the, the furry remnants, and areas that we've already put in invested time and money into such as the restored areas. So with that, um, we'd like to ask you another question. How do you feel about the priorities that are laid out in this plan? Okay, it looks like, wait, sorry, I didn't mean to cut it short, um, but we're running short on time. So um, it looks like most people agree with them, with four agreeing and, and everybody agrees, at least somewhat, uh, and two people strongly agree. So that's, that's encouraging. Thank you very much for that feedback. Looks like maybe we're going in the right direction. Okay. Next slide. <clears throat> so I, I put this in here because um, I wanted to highlight um, an example of some way of something that's happening in the park right now. So we've talked about um, visitors, you know, coming into the park and natural resources. 
which are important to protect. So how do we um, how do we balance those two different uh, aspects of the park um, with the pressure from visitors and the potential impacts that they may um, impose on the park? How, how are we going to protect the resources of the park from that? Well, we have here's a good example to illustrate this. Um, this is happening right now in the park in, in Whitetail. Uh, what you see here is a is a beaver dam in that middle photo and a lodge, which is on the western end of the park by the boardwalk. Well, the county recently replaced the old boardwalk with a new one, which is right next to the beaver lodge. Um, we don't want that to get damaged by flooding. And in typically in a situation like this, most places would just trap out the beaver, moving them or probably end up uh, killing them. We didn't want to do that because we know that beaver are a keystone species for our wetlands. They're important and they're also potentially an attractive feature for visitors. Uh, so we wanted to protect the boardwalk from getting damaged, but not at the expense of the beaver. How do we make these two things coexist? Well, we discovered through some of our research that there is a structure called a beaver pond leveler out there that basically is a big porous tube that conducts water across the beaver dam from the high side to the low side without disturbing the beavers. And it doesn't pr prompt them or induce them or stimulate them to start building up their dam, um, which, is, which is not what we'd want because then it would flood out the, the boardwalk. So to make a long story short, we, we built and installed two levelers, and so far they're working. We have not had any flooding on, on the boardwalk, and the beavers are still happily living out their lives. Um, I know I'm kind of running over, so I'm going to quickly go through this. We developed work, uh, work units for, for the plan, for the, for the park, dividing the park into these various units. Um, which helps us more efficiently uh, manage the park. And they're based on boundaries what are, which are natural and artificial, such as what you see here is a diversity of cover types like savanna, woodland, and wetland. Now, each work unit was evaluated in terms of their management needs and based on the goals and recommendations of the plan and uh, the natural resources of the, the county natural resources staff's experience and best professional judgment, um, we determined ta uh, certain tasks that's, that needed to be done for each of the work units. Um, these tasks were uh, listed and we estimated costs for each task um, based on <clears throat> recent bids from similar projects. We compiled them into a table and summarize them for the vegetation management of the park. Then we organize them into phases based on priorities and goals. The work plan looks at the phases for the first five years and then the next 15 years after that for a horizon of 20 years. Um, we did the same for the water and wildlife resources of the park. And you can see that, and those are, those are shown on this slide. You can see that the restoration costs for vegetation are minimal because most of the park has already undergone an initial restoration. Upcoming costs are primarily enhancements and maintenance of already restored areas. Phasing can be adjusted as needed. This is presented as a recommendation strategy. Summaries of all the tasks and costs are provided in this table as shown. For example, you can see that the total of all management activities in the park over the course of the next five years is estimated to be approximately $889,000. And for a total of all the years, it is about one and a half million dollars. That seems like a big figure, but when in, in the scheme of things, it's, it's, it's what you would expect for this, uh, this scope that we're looking at for this size of a, an area. And we feel that we did a, a thorough and comprehensive um, job and we think it's an accurate forecast. 
Um, this is also in line with the uh, in direction in line with the direction set forth by the uh, 2017 Natural Resource Management System Plan, which was adopted by the board. Um, which direct, in a, that system plan also directs us to seek external funding as much as possible, um, up to a, at least an amount of 80% for all restoration and enhancement projects, and as much as possible for maintenance projects, although we do recognize that maintenance will probably have to be funded mostly by county dollars. Um, with that, I pose one more poll question. Um, how do you feel about the work plan, about the timing and phasing of tasks and their cost estimates? Okay, um, I guess the poll is, the, the results are in and it, it, it looks like most people think that it's about right. Um, a couple think it, it will take too long and one thinks it's about what they expected. Okay, thanks very much for your, um, your feedback your, <laughs> and your comments on that. Um, yeah, it probably is gonna take a long time. One of the, the reasons we look at like a 20 year vision is because natural resources were, um, it took a long time for them to become degraded and it sort of takes a long time for them to get back to a, a, a stable condition, a healthy condition. And we look, we try to look at the long term, but yeah, it does, it, it is a long time, I agree. Okay, um, great, well, With that, um, we're wrapping up here with my presentation. The next steps are after the 30 day public review ends and we receive all the comments, we will incorporate them into the plan and bring it back um, to the planning commission and the uh, county board. And hopefully we will gain adoption of the plans in September or maybe October. With that, I will entertain any questions you may have. Okay, I guess there are no questions. All right, well, um, since we, we are, I went a little bit over even though we had an introduction period that cut into my time. <laughs> um, I'll hand it off to Chris, Christian Klatt. Thank you, Joe. Um, and for those, uh, I have a few poll questions in my presentation too. If those aren't working for you, I just want you to feel free to uh, um, uh, raise your hand with uh, um, the, the Zoom tool to do so, and then we can unmute your mic, or if you can type in the, in the group chat, that will work great too. Okay, so we're going to be talking next about the River to River Greenway NRMP, and uh, I wanted to start by um, sorry, uh, there, I'm trying to advance my slides. Um, discussing this uh, greenway, which is about 7.6 miles that connects South St. Paul to Mendota Heights up near Lilydale. And uh, when we chose the study area along this county greenway, we were looking at lands that are adjacent to the greenway that are open to the public. And these are these publicly accessible lands are owned by either cities, uh, school districts, or nonprofit entities, such as Dodge Nature Center, in addition to a county park. And uh, by looking at these lands, we're, we're evaluating what their conservation potential is. And, in, and a lot of conservation work has been done in these eight, uh, 830 acres that we're uh, evaluating in this plan. Um, so I'm just going to discuss a little bit of the highlights uh, uh, as you walk along this path from west to east and we'll get a sense of uh, what this looks like and what can be done and how the county can potentially play a role in that. 
Um, so to start with, I'd like to uh, throw out some introductory discussion questions just for 30 seconds if, if you want to indicate how much you use the greenways and uh, your frequency of use. And if also you could uh, just discuss uh, if you are a regular user of the greenway, what are the uh, primary reasons that you use it? And I can't tell if the, the poll is currently being launched, but oh, there we are. Thank you. It looks like many of you are, are uh, frequent users of the trail. And again, if you have a, a, a other, you, um, uh, if you had an indicated other, then feel, feel free to elaborate if you'd like in the, in the group chat. And uh, I'm so glad that everyone uh, that's familiar with this is here tonight to, to talk about it further. So you're not the only ones that use this greenway. When I did a, an analysis of which rare uh, plants and animals are uh, can be found within one mile of the Greenway. Uh, there were a lot of uh, rare features, and so I, I'm just going to focus on those that are maybe not in the Mississippi River, like a lot of these rare mussels, and some of which haven't been seen for over a century. But focus more on um, uh, Blanding's turtle, which was seen about 20 years ago, and then uh, our new federally endangered insect, uh, Bombus affinis, or the rusty patch bumblebee which was seen as recently as a week ago by one of our staff members at Thompson County Park. And, uh, and in fact, this is an, an enormously important corridor for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. Uh, the USDA uh, creates maps of the high uh, potential habitat zones for the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. And in the red here, you can see that our Greenway study area is completely encompassed within this region. So it's very important for even rare wildlife, despite it being uh, very uh, urban or suburban in context and very highly developed. So to start with uh, our discussion of what we saw historically along the Greenway and then uh, how that translates to what we could potentially do to help the ecosystem stay, I just wanted to call your attention to uh, Valley Park in Mendota Heights and, and from the 1937 aerials that are shown here you can see that the, the ravines, I'm gonna just put a laser pointer on this to kind of illustrate what I'm, what I'm pointing to, sorry. Um, I can't see my slides too much, sorry. So you can see from this map that there were, in the steepest part of the ravines as it's entering the river, that there, these were already heavily forested and, and then there were pockets of sparse trees but again, like we were talking with whitetail woods, a lot of these areas were um, you know, very open. Um, what does this look like today? Um, oftentimes we see this is heavily forested now in which you have uh, what I'm calling wet forest um, dominated by cottonwoods and aspen and, and, uh, and other trees uh, that were recently, uh, have recently grown up in this area as well as uh, some existing oak woodlands and oak forest. And what I, that's what I've indicated in, in red and orange. And so what we'd like to do as a future, um, in a future scenario within Valley Park here is to enhance those oak forests and, and woodlands to re remove invasive species and try to create as open of an understory as possible and potentially uh, inter reintroduce fire in some of these areas. Here's a couple pictures from on the ground here. You can see on the left picture, this is the wet forest that I was describing along the creek. That's Valley uh, Creek that uh, runs north up to the river. And then on the right, you see an area of oak uh, woodland that, uh, where, act, where uh, buckthorn has been actively removed. In the southern part of Valley Park here is a little bit more open, but there are pockets of forest there that could be enhanced as well. I'm going to move a little bit eastward to Dodge Nature Center. And uh, this Dodge Nature Center is quite a mix of different eco 
uh, systems. There's a lot of wetland habitat as well as uh, recently um, afforested areas or areas that have recently grown up with forest that were historically prairie, but other areas that have uh, remnant oak uh, woodlands as well. On the upper uh, left picture, you can see an, an oak that when it was uh, young must have been out in the open because you can kind of see some lateral branches that are, that are spreading with a spreading crown. But uh, a lot of the understory has since grown up with uh, invasive shrubs like buckthorn and some other fast growing trees like box elder. Um, on the right, this is what it looks like when those areas are actively managed for buckthorn. And uh, Dodge Nature Center has, has taken on a lot of that removal themselves in partnership with Great River Greening. And then moving a little bit northeastward then, uh, here's a historic 1937 aerial photograph of, of the Do Dodge Nature Center main property, as well as uh, some of the properties in West St. Paul, in, including Garlow and Marthaler parks. And again, you can see in these areas that there are there were oak woodlands even back then uh, within this corridor, and it's those sentinel uh, legacy oaks that were very interested in, in preserving and protecting, but as, as well as uh, uh, looking for new opportunities to bring about more biological diversity in other areas. And so with that, the Dodge Nature Center property, uh, here I've shown areas where they've uh, restored some of their prairie, and uh, those are educational opportunities for for students and the public to, that, uh, uh, that explore this area. And uh, in addition, they're planting maple uh, trees for maple sugaring, and that could potentially become a, a maple basswood type forest in the center of their main property. Other areas in Garlow Park, here's a, uh, some of the legacy oaks I mentioned, as well as some of the more recent forest areas. Um, Darla Park itself could be, is, is mainly composed of some of that uh, legacy oak woodland. In some areas, there's a potential for that to be opened up more into a savanna or it's compatible with its current use as a frisbee golf course. And, uh, and then Marthaler Park is a very similar situation, but there are opportunities for um, lawns that could be converted into uh, habitat areas and stormwater ponds that can have some uh, stormwater shoreline uh, native plantings. Finally, I wanted to discuss uh, an area in South St. Paul in uh, what's now known as uh, Kaposia Park, and this is Simon's Ravine. This was identified by the Minnesota County Biological Survey as being one of the most uh, high quality and, and diverse habitats along the River to River Greenway corridor, and it, it consists of uh, a mixture of oak woodland, oak forest, and, uh, and there are pockets of, of maple basswood forest as well. And then the upper, it, when we look at a historical aerial photograph, you can see that this was, was mainly forested throughout that ravine area. And then in the upper, upper areas, uh, higher elevation areas, those were much more open with uh, sparse oak trees. And so look, considering Poja Park today, much could be done to bring about some of that savanna habitat while still making it compatible for uh, users to enjoy the recreational facilities that are there. In addition, there's opportunities for enhancing and uh, expanding on uh, open prairie habitats and wet meadows along the creek going to the, towards the Mississippi River. So to describe some of the work that could be done, I mentioned as we were looking at some of these photographs and maps, uh, that as we're looking at target communities associated with oak forest and, and woodlands, we're largely looking at as a restoration process, removing the uh, invasive shrubs. And in some cases where there is a potential for savanna habitat to coexist in these areas, that's where we would potentially take out some of the uh, trees that are uh, faster growing and may have more recently invaded the areas such as box elder and hackberry walnuts. Um, in addition, it would be great if we could continue um, planting additional woodland forbs and uh, in tackling other invasive species like garlic mustard that are rearing their ugly heads and, uh, and eventually focusing on more of a, a long-term maintenance regime to keep these invasives out. For wetlands and shorelines, there's uh, potential to do uh, 
some restoration that would include a lot more native habitat for the rusty patch and other and other pollinator species and and bring about instead of having hybrid cattail and green canary grass meadows that we could convert them perhaps to something that has a little bit more wildlife value such as sedge meadows and so with that i would like to pose a restoration discussion question in which you know some of the dominant communities that i've or target communities that i've mentioned in this presentation do you support the restoration of these target plant communities that are proposed in this plan? And if you do have uh, different ideas as to about uh, what some of these areas could become, I'd be very happy to hear more detail about that if you want to share some, some of your ideas in the, in the, in the chat. Well, great, it looks like a lot of you are are, um, find that these restoration plans are in agreement with which, what you'd like to see, but some of you do have uh, many changes you'd like to see. And I, again, I'd, I'd be glad to hear more about that so you could share some of your ideas with me. Now I'm gonna transition a little bit to how is this all gonna get paid for? I didn't put a final price tag on it, but when we did the natural resource management plan, you'll find that there's a proposed uh, cost estimate for these restoration uh, areas to be about $1.8 million. And this is to be implemented in over a 20-year time period. So it's not all going to come at once, but it's a consideration that we would like as a county to support some of these uh, public landowners to in, uh, enact some of these restoration activities in their parks and uh, in, in areas that are open to the public. So the county typically has a 30-foot easement along its greenway trails that I've indicated here in blue. And additionally, we adopted a document um, called the Greenway Guidebook back in 2010 that indicated that there are areas along these greenways that should have a certain natural signature associated with them, native plantings and uh, habitat value. And that's what I've indicated in red. In this case, this is indicating a 100-foot urban greenway corridor. And then outside of that area are lands, these public areas that are contiguous with the property and would, we would like to see have a, a similar uh, natural signature, but it's largely um, uh, areas that we would want to consider in conjunction with restoration activities that are happening within the greenway uh, easement and greenway corridor. So with that, the county, this natural resource management plan is proposing that the county will uh, start to develop a cost share program with these public landowners, the cities and nonprofits and school districts that lie with on, along the Greenway Corridor. Um, in this case, I, I showed that uh, blue county easements that the county would be completely responsible for in terms of its uh, any costs associated with the restoration, the project management and maintenance. Likewise, this greenway corridor that I indicated in red, we're proposing that the county would not own this land outright, but would rather um, provide a 50% cost share associated with any grant uh, match. So those are dollars that are provided on our half to match a grant that would pay for the majority of the restoration costs. And so that lowers the barrier for a lot of cities and public entities that are interested in doing this work, but cannot on their own property. Additionally, um, the county is interested in, in helping out with restoration project management as needed in a partnership, as well as the county would be willing to take on the responsibility for long-term maintenance of this, if this proposal goes through. I've, I'm largely going to talk about the natural lands beyond the corridor in, that, in saying that the, the county's land conservation plan, which is currently in development, would um, propose a similar cost share structure, but that's all yet to be determined as the counties and cities and, and other uh, public partners will join a, 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 a partnership uh, um, collaborative to discuss those um, coming uh, cost share proposals. And to advance the slide here, I'm just gonna, there we are. So finally, I wanted, uh, open up this question to, to you all. How does the 
uh, what should the county's primary role be in managing the natural resources along the Greenway Trail? Um, should we be removing invasive species, creating additional habitat for wildlife, maintaining aesthetics, or improving water quality? Or do you have some other ideas? And you can choose more than one answer here. This, uh, we just like to hear what your priorities are. Hey, Chris, while people are taking the poll, there is a question in the chat um, about how will you reconcile the planting for the Anthropocene, I'm not, probably not pronouncing that correctly, using a pre-Lewis and Clark plant community paradigm? That's a great question. I think one thing, I'm interested in is uh, how we are adapting to the realities of climate change in that, you know, as our season, our shoulder seasons are becoming warmer and wetter and our, our winters may become um, less warm and it's, or sorry, our, 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 our warm temperatures in the winters will be, will be higher, that perhaps our, our barometer is changing and uh, we need to be aware of how we're going to, um, to adapt to that. So what we propose in the Natural Resource Management Plan is an adaptive framework in which we try to see what works and, um, and if, if it's not working, we respond to it. So we have a lot of vegetative monitoring going on in our other park systems and we have yet to expand that to our greenways. And again, we're, um, we're also considering that these public lands have a certain character associated, the neighbors want to see a certain uh, land use type. Um, and so that we, we aren't proposing that we come in and turn everything back to Savannah, except if in areas where we could potentially hold on to some of those legacy oaks that we'd like to see uh, have some uh, recruitment. But I, I, I agree that it is a moving target and we, we are interested in seeing how these results are, um, are adaptive to the future, set, you know, future situation. Um, so with that, it looks like a lot of people have a pretty um, wide range in what they'd like to see the county play a role in. And uh, I appreciate that you um, feel that we do have a role to play in, in a, lot of the, uh, a lot of these areas. And then finally, I'd like to finish a uh, this poll with uh, one additional question. Um, do you support the proposal that the county would help other public landowners, cities, schools, nonprofits uh, to complete natural resource projects along the Greenway? We'll just give maybe a little bit, uh, 20 seconds for this poll or so, so that we can finish up on time. And additionally, as we, um, as we finish up at, at our a stated time of seven o'clock. I just want to invite you all, if you have additional questions, we will be willing to stay here and, and, and answer more and engage you uh, more fully. So uh, don't feel that we need to finish immediately at seven o'clock if, uh, if you're interested in, in talking more. Well, great, thank you for your input. And it looks like unanimously for those that voted that you're interested in seeing the county play this role. And so I'm just gonna go over some of the next steps that we have. Uh, we're gonna finish our public comment period on August 15th and uh, the final draft will be considered for adoption uh, before the planning commission uh, later this uh, month. And then we'll, the county board will decide whether to adopt this plan in September. And then we're in, in, in Thompson County Park, we're interested in engaging some restoration starting in 2021. In concomitant with that, we'd like to uh, begin uh, some of our Greenway pollinator projects uh, in conjunction with, uh, with that restoration process in Thompson about the same time. So with that, I just want to uh, show a picture here of our rusty patch bumblebee that I mentioned earlier. I invite you to ask more questions. You can also email me at the um, email listed here. And I want to make sure I provide access to the plan. So I'm gonna um, just give one more, uh, I'm just gonna post this link into the comments so that you have immediate uh, access to the plan's uh, webpage. And so with that, I thank you for listening and I'd like to open it up for any questions.
Well, I'm just going to quick paste this, uh, this URL into the comments so you have access to the page here. We are. And I'd like to thank you all for joining today. If, if no one else has any other additional comments, I appreciate, appreciate all your input that you did um, supply in, in the form of the polls. And I hope to hear more uh, either by direct email or by um, any other way you want to get in touch with me through the, uh, after taking a look at the plan. And uh, thank you very much. If there's any other questions about Whitetail Woods, I'm sure Joe would be willing to answer them as well. Right. Does anybody have any questions about either of the plans or anything? Okay, great. Um, well, thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. It was really, really fun sharing all this with you, you folks. And so exciting to see that all these people are interested enough in the parks to give up some of their awesome free time on a Thursday night. Um, like Chris said before, the, there is a, you can go to the county website for more information. You can also do that with the Whitetail Woods plan. And I'm sorry I didn't post that on, on my presentation, but if anybody wants to see, you, you can just go to the county website for Dakota County Parks, click, click on the parks part of it, and go to um, uh, well, what what let's see now about us. Go to the about us part on the top, um, on the top of the website, and then you'll see um, natural resource management plans is an option, and click on that, and they're all listed, and you can find out in more information about all the plans, and click on a link of. Uh, the draft plan for Whitetail and for River to River. <clears throat> um, and get in touch with us that way too. So thanks everybody and thanks uh, commissioners for coming. And I see that there, are, uh, there were at least, there's at least one planning commissioner here too. Thank you. And thank you Lil for helping out um, organize all this stuff and handle all, handle all the uh, chats and everything. Okay, well, with that, I guess, uh, is there, do you have anything more to say, Chris? No, thanks everyone. Appreciate your participation. All right, well, goodbye everybody and have a great night. Yay. Nice job, guys. Yeah, thanks, Lil. So I'll send you, note taking was pretty easy. So I'll uh, send you the screenshots of the.